Uh, you can shout this for this. <laughs> Good evening. Uh, and I, first of all, of course, I want to thank uh, Lauren for bringing us out here. And uh, today was just so incredible. Uh, it was really you know, quite moving. And I'm sure Lois is uh, smiling uh, with, with us. And that's the first thing I always want to say. What is what is a day like today mean to you? And you got obviously got very emotional even talking about it. Again. <laughs> we all got emotional. Yeah, it, it's it's was really extraordinary. I mean, those of you who were there at the unveiling of the market this afternoon, I, I knew I was going to cry. And yes, I cried. Um, and I think it, it's when you study someone for so long, you feel like you know them, mm -hmm. and. A little bit, not a lot, but I feel like I know her a little bit. But I, even more so, I think I feel really responsible for her historical legacy, and I feel very angry that she does not have the place in history that she deserves. And so, a moment like this is is an incredible step forward in ensuring her place. And so, it, it's I, I'm very moved with things like this happening. But it it uh, it must feel like. You know, the, the, the time has finally arrived, like this year and with the DVD, and uh, I don't know if you know, but the DVD received the New York Film Critics Award, so, you know, she and other female pioneers are getting a lot of uh, recognition. What, what, do you, what do you think that it is that this time is happening? I, I think you're right. It's, it's an incredible moment because it's this six disc set which Tino put out, which is not just Weber, but it's many of her contemporaries. There was an extraordinary moment of women's filmmaking in the early years of the industry, and she was part of that. Um, Milestone has put out two new restorations of feature films. Um, there are, there's a new documentary on Alice Lachey, another early filmmaker. And I think that the discussions that are happening now in Hollywood about gender equity, about inclusion, uh, about the need for women in positions of creative control, writing, and producing, and directing, um, that that conversation is fueling the history. And, and from my perspective, it's, it's absolutely necessary because we've been told for so long this myth that, that filmmaking is a man's game, right? that women are only on the screen, that women are only actors. And that has never been true. And 100 years ago, it really wasn't true. There were many, many women in positions of creative control. So I think it's, I think there's a, I think the contemporary dialogue is fueling this look backwards, mm -hmm. which to a film historian like me is, is fabulous. <laughs> so when you, I was saying today, you know, when I grew up, my grandfather, you know, gave me the book, The Men Who Made the Movies, and, and then even subsequently reading books by film people like Peter Bogdanovich, you know, who wrote a great book, Who the Devil Made This. There's about 50 interviews with directors. They did, he did start in the 60s. He didn't find one female director to interview, thus creating a narrative that women didn't direct. And I mean, I guess it's a sort of simplistic question, but like, how did this narrative begin where women started to get written out of the history books? It's a really important question. I mean, that's the question. And, and it begins with the very first histories of Hollywood that are written in the late 20s and early 30s when the industry is converting to sound. It really starts to look backwards, and there's early histories that are written. And those early histories, which are written while women like Weber are still alive and still making films, right. only remember women. Only remember Pickard for her role on screen, and, and we know she had an incredible role behind the scenes, right? right. Um, and so that the narrative starts really, really early, and um, Kiran Ward Mahar, a, a film historian colleague of mine, has I think a very compelling theory about why. And her theory is that in the early twenties, when power in Hollywood is consolidating in, in, in the hands of a few studios whose names are still with us, right? They still dominate the entertainment landscape. That in order to consolidate their power and buy up theater chains and control the market, they had to borrow a lot of money from Wall Street. And her theory is that they kind of bought into a Wall Street corporate culture, which at that point was very male dominated. And so that mindset um, also fueled the mindset of keeping women out and that uh, coming, and that the histories that then 
forgot about women who follow very shortly after that. Because one of the things that I thought was very interesting is they did write books, a lot of these women. It's just yeah. that, you know, you, they didn't really get around. And did you find her own book useful when you were writing about her? She, well, this is, the, this is the heartbreaking thing. Yes, many of the women active as, as actors and screenwriters and directors, many of them wrote memoirs, mm -hmm. uh, trying to ensure their legacy, right? right. Um, trying to ensure, trying to rewrite history, trying to ensure that their name was part of history. Weber did the same thing. Um, and she did it in two ways. When sound came into Hollywood in the late 20s, and her career was faltering, she took out ads in trade magazines saying, hi, I directed some of the early <laughs> films <laughs> almost 20 years ago. Um, but then later in her life, she wrote a memoir uh, in the circle. She tried to get it published. She did not get it published. The manuscript was in the possession of her sister Ethel after she after uh, Lois Weber died, and it's presumed lost. Uh -huh. So there, there is there's a memoir out there somewhere. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a manuscript out there somewhere, but it's lost. And so uh, that to me is is really tragic that we don't have her right. account to be as a, as a as a starting place as mm -hmm. as you know ground zero. We don't have that. Um, but she tried. I mean, that to me is yeah. evidence that she tried to to write herself into history. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's what I was thinking was very interesting. So I wanted to go back to her. How did she get from Pittsburgh to Hollywood? Well, it's a circuitous path. So she leaves here um, with the aim of being a, a pianist, concert pianist. Okay, she's very very talented in the piano. She moves to New York. Um, to, to further her studies in piano, um, and, be, and and has a career as a touring pianist. She does some of that work. She, she travels around the country. We can see there's evidence of that. From there, she gets into the theater, travels around the country in the theater, um, meets her first husband, Philip Smalley, who's also an actor and stage manager. They get married in Chicago, um, and move back to the New York area. He's the one who starts in movies, um, and he starts acting in movies. And she says in interviews, to amuse herself while, while he's away at work, she starts writing down stories. Now, it's clear from other interviews that she had been writing stories since childhood. She talks about, she talks about writing as one of, as really her primary form of her expression. As, as a girl, she was clear. She was writing stories. She told them to her father. He loved to hear her stories. So she's continuing to do that while her husband, her husband Philip Smalley, is um, acting in movies. And then at some point, it's not exactly clear how, she joins him, right? starts acting with him, and starts writing this, the films that they're in. And then they start co-directing. And film directing in the early days is kind of a loose term. And right. Really, they didn't even have that term at first. But but that means starting to decide where the camera's placed and who moves where and how they're going to move their body and the things we now associate with directing. They started to do that together. Um, so they're doing that in New York. And then in 1913. Um, they move west to LA, just as the film industry is really starting to consolidate in and around LA. So they make that move at a very crucial time. The little company they were working for in New York um, becomes part of the Universal brand, and they move west as Universal City is being built, and it's an it's a important move. And when did she get into it? Because we're going to talk about Universal and what a fertile, just this amazing place where all these women film directors were, but when did, when did she start making what we think of as the, these social movie uh, movies with a, with a theme of socialism, and does this tie back in, in some of your writing to her kind of evangelistic upbringing? I mean, I think she starts really early. We, we, the films we think of are the features that she made when she was Universal's top director, films like where my children or shoes, um, but I think 
the early films that she starts to make from 1910 onwards, many of them deal with social themes. They deal with poverty or infidelity um, or class structure, right? So I think from the beginning, she's interested in using film to deal with complex issues. Um, and even, there's a point when she leaves Universal because they won't let her make feature films, they won't let her make lengthy films, and she moves to a small company called Bosworth, and even there she starts to make some of her first features are about social issues. Um, one of her first features, Sunshine Molly, is about sexual assault and sexual harassment in the workplace, and so she's not afraid of these big <laughs> yeah. issues that we're still dealing with. Um, so I think it's with her from the beginning, this idea of um, cinema being a medium, as she says, where I can preach to my heart's content. Um, and, and I don't think for her that doesn't mean, preaching doesn't mean um, proselytizing Christianity, it means having a point of view right. um, and um, having, making a statement about something. To, and so is that phrase to educate and make aware, is, is that attributed to her, that, that idea of aware, social awareness through the films? I, I think so, yeah. I mean, the, the other, she compared her films to two, she compared films to sermons, and you can see by the, the preaching element of them. And she also compared her films to um, a newspaper editorial. And so I think that, to me, is, is a nice balance, because what, she, what she's, when she's thinking of her films as a sermon, she's thinking of the kind of uh, intimate address that a clergy person might have to a, a, con a regular congregation, a, a, a congregants that you could, you could speak about a particular point of view. And then when you think about a newspaper editorial, that's modern mass communication. Right. That's, that's, that's a large scale message. In both cases, she's invested in that message and getting across a message in a simple, clear way. Mm -hmm. um, and were her films successful? I mean, do we have do we have any kind of idea that yes. they fill the seats? To... Extremely successful. So Where Are My Children, which is the first of two films she makes on the campaign to legalize birth control, was Universal's number one movie maker in 1916. So, and I always say that amazing. we cannot imagine Universal greenlighting a film <laughs> written and directed by a woman on abortion and birth control today. Yeah. And it was their top money maker over 100 years ago. Um, so, yes, she was a very, she was Universal's top director in the sense of the most respected director mm -hmm. um, and one of their top money makers. Okay, so let's talk about Universal now because, again, it's fascinating. More than any other studio of the time, they they had women directors, writers, producers, etc. And yes, just could talk about why that is, or yes, any particular reasons for that. They were called the Universal Women, and um, <laughs> if you're interested in the Universal Women, it's um, really fascinating. Mark Garrett Cooper has a great book called Universal Women. Um, and yeah, so Weber was part of a whole cohort of female filmmakers there in the mid-1910s. And it's, it's clear to me that, that, that she was an important driving force in that, in the mm -hmm. sense that many of the women that became directors acted for her as well. And I think that they must have seen um, in her example um, what, might have, what was possible. Um, and so I think, and, and there was a, a philosophy at, in, at Universal City at that time where of the, the, the motto was a motto about um, this being both a workplace and a community um, where, I'm going to forget the logo, where work, work is play and play is work, I think that's the right Universal mm -hmm. logo, right? And, 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 and underneath that motto was an idea of this being a modern workplace where men and women work together as equals. Right. And so I think that that idea of community and, uh, and gender equity and the model that Weber provided of what was possible mm -hmm. in this creative field was, I think that was very powerful. I mean, there were, there were other historians who talk more about the money aspect, you know, that Carl Lindley, who ran Universal, was cheap, and so he could pay his female filmmakers less. <laughs> Maybe that was true too. Um, but I, but every 
Harry Studio developed in a way when you think of Columbia, you think of Harry Cohen. So every studio does have an identity, and I love this idea that Universal, you know, had this identity with with women. Maybe, you know, maybe it was because they were cheap, but they were there and and they worked. And they and they celebrated it too. Because, yeah. Um, Weber and and some other women at the studio ran in the first mayoral election for the municipal election at Universal City. They ran on an all female female women suffrage ticket before women had the vote nationally, right? And they were mocked relentlessly in the in the press, right, about petticoats taking over Universal City. But <laughs> Universal, to its credit, Universal put up publicity saying, "No, no, no, we're proud of these women. We we have brains and beauty behind the scenes at Universal." Mm -hmm. And so they they embraced. That Universal definitely embraced it. I, I wish they would embrace this history now. Yeah. <laughs> they don't, but they did that. Well, that was the next thing I was going to say. Is the philosophy then was well, women, we, we want to have women go to see movies, so why not have women writers because they could write more effectively for women? And then again, somewhere along the way, history got changed and they said, oh, no, no, we only make movies for boys 18 to. 30, you know, yeah. so somebody created that narrative uh, uh, along with the original narrative, which seems pretty accurate. When we go to see movies, when I have women writers. Absolutely, absolutely. And and in the teens and 20s, I mean, by the late 20s, some people have, some people at the time were suggesting that 83% of moviegoers in 1927 were women. And so clearly dominated the box office. Uh, I wanted to ask about her relationship with her husband. And that, and eventually they got divorced. But uh, what was their, you, you know, tell me about their personal life. They they had a real creative collaboration, as far as I can tell, and that was important to her and to, to both of them. Uh, and they, in the early years of their career, when they um, were working at Rex in New York City before they came west to LA, they were often billed as the Smalleys. Um, he was Philip Smalley. And so they were sometimes billed as the Smalleys, and they really um, worked as a unit. They, they appeared on screen together, often playing husband and wife or, or a couple of some sort. Right? Um, they co-directed uh, the stories that she had written. And so they were a real unit at first, and I think a real supportive unit. But by the time um, she gets to making feature films in the mid-teens, it's clear that um, she's the dominant. Um, the trade magazines at the time are saying that. They're saying, well, why is he even getting billing? Because we all know she does it. He is saying that. Um, the publicity for um, The Dumb Girl of Puticci, her big, huge feature with Anna Pavlova, the publicity, he says, all, I'm just doing my best to support her vision. Um, so they, so it was, a, I think, at first, a very equal partnership. And then her talent and her drive just dominated his side. Um, and they, uh, they eventually divorced in 1921, um, but remained friends. She said they remained friends. She directed him um, several years later in a film of hers after they were divorced. So I think it's clear that they, they maintained a kind of professional relationship. It's, it's very clear, though, that after they divorced, if there was ever any question about who was the driving force in creating films, he never directed again. No. Uh, I mean, it's very clear that, 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 that was the, the view. And uh, she was also very supportive of other uh, female actresses and writers. And I was wondering if you could talk about which writers and yes. some of the actresses that yes. she worked with. I mean, I think that this is this is another piece of you know. People now are saying, well, why is it important to have female filmmakers? Um, and there's, there's lots of answers to that yeah. question, right? But one of them is that um, women support women. And, and Weber's career is an example of that in many ways. She provided really tangible support to um, female screenwriters. Uh, Frances Marion, first and foremost. Um, Frances Marion went on to be a very well-recognized Academy Award-winning screenwriter. Um, but began her career working with Weber, and you know Weber sort of said, "I took her under my wing," and and Mar they, be they were lifelong friends, um, and and Marion always credited Weber for supporting her. Um, Lenore Ka 
coffee. Uh, is yeah. another example we're talking about. Yeah, Lenore Coffee, I don't know if you know, people know, she's a screenwriter, did a lot of very, very famous like women's pictures, uh, great screenwriter. Yeah, so, the, you know, so writers like Marion and Coffee, you know, in the 30s and then Coffee into the 40s, yeah. um, are really prominent screenwriters and they began their early careers working with her. And I think that the way she mentored actresses into becoming directors was important at Universal, so Cleo Madison, uh, George Gaffigal Reed, important. But then I think the other thing she did was, was mentor actresses who, who only wanted to act. She was really instrumental in discovering them and writing roles for them, writing three-dimensional female characters for them to really show their talent. Um, and critics at the time noticed this. Um, they would say, so Mildred Harris, for instance, um, they said, well, a few years ago, she, we weren't very impressed by her, but now that she's in these Robert films, mm -hmm. she's fabulous. And so they understood that there was a kind of connection between the, the roles that Weber was writing and the way that Weber was directing these women that allowed them to shine. So I feel like the mentorship, you know, it's about mentoring women who have aspirations to direct, it's about mentoring screenwriters, and it's about providing these incredible opportunities for, um, for actresses. Mm -hmm. I want to ask you about her, because again, the, the sad thing is, you know, she made over 200 movies, but there's so few movies to look at, to look for a kind of a theme or a voice. You know, when you think of DeMille, you know, you can sort of see a stamp on things, but what was her voice and her theme, do you think, in, in films? I, I see uh, several very clear themes. Um, one is her film, the, there's a predominance of female protagonists in her films. Her films are almost always driven by female protagonists. And what we see in those films, what, whatever issue it is, if it's drug addiction or poverty or fight to abolish capital punishment, or marriage, or celebrity, that, that the female protagonists are often the agents of change. Um, they're often the agents that drive social change. Um, so, so I think that one thread I see is films where, where, where female characters really drive, have agency and really drive. I think she's also really interested, there's a group of films that she makes in the early 20s that are about marriage. Uh, and they're, they're made at a time in the 20s when um, there's a lot of new sexual mores, there's a lot of pressure on traditional marriage uh, and, and traditional ideas of masculinity and femininity. And she makes some very um, biting critiques of traditional marriage and traditional ideas about men. So I see that in those films, and I trace their, it's most evident in the films of the early 20s, but I trace it back to some of the, her early shorts where she's really dealing with very difficult male-female relationships. And um, Then I think another theme that I see running through her work is an interest in um, celebrity and stardom, and particularly the pressures that it puts on women. Um, and and, a, and, it, and towards the end of her career, she makes a trio of films that are very cynical about celebrity and stardom. And I see that they're not about the movie industry, but I see them as allegories about the movie yeah. industry. I call cynicism about the way in which glamour and entertainment and the commodification of female bodies has taken over an industry that 10 years before was interested in films about social change right. and social progress and social justice. That's certainly true as you go into the pre-code movies, they yeah. certainly become yeah. completely different. And that was one of the things I was noticing is when you see a silent film that's directed by D.W. Griffith, it's the damsel in distress and, you know, girl with a curl and very frail. And a lot of the female directed movies, the girls are really spunky. They're depicted as tomboys. Uh, sometimes there's like gender role things. That, that's why they're, it was a, such a treat to be able to watch all these films. Is that something you notice too? A absolutely. I mean, that's another another answer to the question of well, why is it important to have 
for the yeah. movies, is that what's so clear on the, um, the DVD set that we worked on is that women see the world differently. <laughs> and, and women see women differently. And unfortunately, the image from the silent era that carries with us are, are the images yeah. of frail, white, childlike femininity from the films of D.W. Griffith. And yeah. those were out of date when he made the film. <laughs> um, but they linger with us. And then when you right. see the films made by women at, at exactly that same time, as you say, they um, are extremely active. They're extremely, they're physically active. They're smart. They have agency. They make change in the world. They take charge of their own lives. They defy um, social norms and patriarchal norms. So it's, it's really unfortunate, I think, that Griffith's films have but that's the main knowledge people have about silent society. I think that's why when people see the movies, it's such a revelation. Uh, not only the depictions of women, but also the technical yeah. uh, capabilities. I mean, we just saw with the split screen. and uh, Was she one of the first people to implement the sp split screen? She was. I mean, this, this sort I mean, of shocking. trip to me. Yeah, I mean, the, the, this film suspense, I think, gives you an idea of her technical virtuosity. I mean, I, I often talk about her interest in social themes and her female characters, but as a, as a visual storyteller, she is amazing. And what you see in a film like Suspense are not just the, the triptych split screen, but amazing shots. The shots from the moving car with a little right. side mirror, um, the shots in the house with, that make use of the mirror reflection of the character that the, Lois Weber is playing and, and of her doubled in the frame, um, I mean, really amazing visual storytelling. And she, um, you see that again and again and again. And, and the cinematographer who we believe shot Suspense, Dal Clawson, is a cinematographer that moved with her from company to company to company. And it's clear that they had a very tight collaboration. Um, and some of the other things that, that I really, like sort of technical things that I associate with her are, um, she, she was very um, is very committed to shooting on location uh, into the late teens and early 20s when most studios were starting to construct huge facilities and, and keeping everything um, on, on the lot. She was very committed to shooting on location, including shooting interior locations, very rare in the 20s to shoot interior locations. So she would rent a huge, um, generator, a truck with a generator on it, didn't drive it out to a, a palatial house and shoot on location there. Um, so she really is an amazing visual storyteller, I think. So after she left Universal, she did, she set up dis her own distribution agreements, which again is yeah. another thing that is incredible. Um, I mean, so she really did it all. She, yeah, I mean, she, she left Universal yeah, in mid-1917 to, to start to form her own studio. So she rented a, a palatial residential estate on Santa Monica Boulevard and um, converted it into a, a film studio. She used the main house as her offices and she used the outbuildings for labs and props and costumes. She constructed a big outdoor stage where they could um, shoot, you know, with the wow. rest of the cover. Um, and struck very lucrative distribution deals, first with Universal, where she had worked, and then with Paramount, very so that she was the highest paid director uh, in Hollywood because of the lucrative deals she had struck to distribute her work. And, and to, in 1917, that was very forward thinking. The directors were just beginning to, to move out and start their own companies and control their own destiny, and so she's a part of that, that move. So then it's just a few, this is where it gets difficult to believe. So it's just a few years later, by 1922, that she is now struggling to find work. Yeah, yeah. And, and what, how did that come about? The industry really changes. So in that uh -huh. interval between 1917, when she strikes out on her own, when she's, you know, she's Universal's top director, she right. strikes out and she gets, gets lucrative contracts, and 21, when her company collapses, that's a huge change in the industry. That is the period, exact period, when the big studios are consolidating power, buying up theater chains, and pushing out independence. Uh, and so it becomes very hard for independent studios like hers to keep going. Hers and many, many independent right. studios collapse. 
collapse during that period, right? Um, and in her case in particular, what happens in 1921 is that she is continuing to make um, films with very biting social commentary. This is the period when she's making films about marriage. Mm -hmm. um, and she makes a film while she's still under contract with Paramount to distribute called What Do Men Want? Um, which is a very biting critique of masculinity and what men want. Um, and it features a public suicide of a young woman who has, uh, a single woman who's been pregnant by her lover, lover has abandoned her, and she commits suicide from a bridge in a public park. She's called to Paramount headquarters in New York, and they say, we cannot distribute this film, and we are dissolving our contract. Um, and so that's the, so she has to dissolve her company. She kind of lives along for a little while, but she has to dissolve her company, and, and it becomes very hard then for any independent companies to survive in that entertainment landscape that's, that's both controlled by the studios and controlled by studios that have a particular image that they want to preserve that does not involve critiques of what men want. Wow, and, and, and what happens to her after that? Does she get any supervisory work? Or? She goes back to Universal in 1923 to make a chapter in her life. Um, a, a, a remake of a film she had made earlier, Jewel, a, a Christian science story, which she was very invested in. And then has a, another couple of years where it's just it's difficult for her to find work. And then in 26, 27, she um, makes a couple films for Universal. She works at the DeMille studio. Um, and then another fallow period um, in the late 20s and early 30s where she's working as a script doctor. She's working as a casting wow. um, coach director, always trying to get work, always writing. Um, and then she makes her last film in 1934, which is a sound film. Um, the first film shot on location on Kauai, she takes a boatload of generators over to, I cannot imagine this enterprise, right? Uh, stands in the middle of, you know, on a stand in a middle of the hurricane field and shoots uh, on location. Um, and then, um, you know, for the next five years, continues to try to get work. She does not ever give up wow. trying to get work. But it's just harder and harder and harder. You know, the idea that in 1934, she's, I mean, the film she makes in uh, Kauai is, a very low budget, almost sort of exploitation film. The idea that, that she's doing that in 34, just 15 years after she Well, that's that's what I'm saying today. I, I can't imagine how difficult it must have been to see contemporaries of yours that were directors and how they all transitioned to sound and and she did, that must have been heartbreaking. Is that something that she ever spoke about or? She, I, I haven't heard her speak about exactly that thing, um, but, I, but indirectly, you know, as I was saying before, she it was clear that she wanted to mark her place in history, mm -hmm. and she did talk about that. She didn't specifically um, compare herself, but she, she did, you know, she worked uh, at DeMille Studio in 27. Um, she did continue to reach out to DeMille as, as he, continues his success into the 30s. But they were contemporaries of peers, right? Yeah. Uh, she continued to try to reach out to him um, successfully. I wanted you to talk a little bit about uh, our, our the DVD set, because I was saying, to me, the, the real game changer is the ability to see the films, uh, you know, and, and in such good quality, not little bits and pieces, and what heroes the preservationists are and how they go about finding these films. Yeah, um, yeah. it's really, I mean, I have to credit the Library of Congress and the Women's Film Preservation Fund. The Women's Film Preservation Fund has been funding preservations of films by women for a long, long time, 20 years, I think. Um, and the Library of Congress really stepped up for this DVD set and accelerated preservations of films that, that um, they had, that they own, right? Um, but it's it's really, and I have to credit Kino Lorber. I mean, really, when they first approached me about this, it was actually going to be a, a just a Lois Weber set, um, and we were talking about that, and then the producer, Brett Wood, said to me, well, 
They let us go to six because there was so much stuff. And even then, we did not include it all. There's way more stuff. Um, but it's, and, and the prints look beautiful, and there's new, I love the new score. The new score for Suspense that you just heard is, I love it. Um, and, and I can already see, I, I teach silent film, and, and I taught many of the, these new versions just this winter, and it transforms people's viewing experience. Completely. To see these films in beautiful yeah. prints with, with beautiful scores, it makes them accessible. For too long, they were, you know, if, if people saw them outside an archive, it was some scratchy print on YouTube without right. any sound. And that, that does not do the films justice. And you mentioned the music, and too, so, so many times the music adds so much, and, and are you aware of some of the composers? I know that you said originally they tried to get all the glory, but it's predominantly women Composers also do yes, that. yes. We tried to get a hundred percent female composers, <laughs> and that, that didn't work out. But there's a, I think there's a really nice mix of um, uh, modern score, modern orchestral scores, like you heard with suspense, and that's a very young woman from the Berklee College of Music, Skylar Nam, who wrote that score. Um, so there's, and there's um, a, a, another avant-garde film that's on the collection. Salome has a fabulous avant-garde oh, score. Incredible. Um, but then there's other, um, Maude Nelson, who is a, um, a accompanist for silent film based in Amsterdam, my favorite accompanist for Weber, accompanies a number of the Weber films on the disc, and phenomenal. She gets Weber in a way that I don't think anybody else does. Um, and it's a sort of traditional piano accompaniment, as you would have had at the time. Um, Fabulous. So there's a real range of scores, and I like I like that mix. I do too. I think they do a fantastic job. We're going to open up to questions, but before it is going to be your least favorite part of the interview, because I, I wanted to ask you about your background and how you got involved in uh, talking about silent films and Lois Weber, and just you know, just so the audience can find out a little bit about you. Well, yeah. So the, so back background of as a film geek. Um, <laughs> Very happy to learn that I could study film in college and that I could then go on to, to become a, a film scholar. And I wasn't, my interest in film was not initially in the silent era. I kind of came to the silent era relatively late in my um, studies at grad school. And I came to it because for me, there, there was a, even before I got to Lois Weber, there's a kind of conjunction of a really interesting period in American history, um, a period, uh, the, the progressive era, when um, there's a lot of social activism, when feminist causes are at the forefront, and it's the beginning of the consolidation of the U.S. film industry and the beginning of the consolidation of film grammar or the visual storytelling. It all kind of comes together, and for me, that that's a really, really, really interesting moment. And it's a moment when film becomes the dominant commercial entertainment, uh, mass entertainment medium, that those early decades of the 20th century. So it all kind of comes together um, for me, and that's... that's and did really Lois, when you were gonna write about Lois Weber, did, what drew you to, to her? I came at her sideways. I came at her because I was doing a whole other project about social issue films, and I, um, thought I was going to include some work on early films on birth control and abortion. And so there she shows up and she's making two of those films. And I I didn't end up working on those films, but she got in, I thought, oh, I'm coming back to her when I finish that project. Um, so that's how I came back to her, was through the social issues. That's what, what interested me. Okay, fantastic. All right, well.